how did I end up where, where I am? Probably learning the importance of money. I remember mum taking me to McDonald's after school and I thought, fantastic, how good's this? And she turned to me and said, go, get, go in there and get an application form. <laughs> and I, I remember coming home after midnight, like 12.30 a.m. I earned, I think, $4.84 an hour. So okay. I'd come home, I'd have less than $20 pre-tax and I would think... That was so hard to make that $20. There is no way I'm just going to spend this on something that, that I don't need. I moved that money into an online savings account and I remember getting the bank putting $20 of interest in my account and thinking, I didn't have to do anything for that $20. It's free money. Yeah. I mean, how good's that? I put... Hi, I'm Owen from Rest Australia. Thanks for tuning into the Rest Network. Before we get to today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoy today's program. Josh, thanks for joining me on the show, mate. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. No worries. Um, you've got a lot to offer the audience, but I imagine that, maybe I wouldn't say few, but there would be people out there that haven't heard of you. So perhaps before we dive into who you are and your journey, you can just tell everyone what role you Phil now at QVG and, and what your day-to-day -day role is there for your job, I guess. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm the Long Short Fund Portfolio Manager at QVG. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got two funds at QVG. We've got one that we call the Opportunities Fund, which is an X100 uh, small cap strategy. Mm -hmm. And then the Long Short Fund that I just mentioned. So that that's an ASX all cap we refer to it as. So everything from the largest company down to the smallest company. Uh, and like I mentioned, we can go long or short, so we can make money from stocks going up or, or from stocks going down. Great. And we're going to get to all of that in the process because there's some really unique insights I think you bring to the series so far. Um, but why don't we go back to where your journey began and just hear more about you and perhaps your, your journey to money and investing and, and really what drove that from an early age. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, from an early age, I mean, I'm a Sydney boy. I grew up in northwest Sydney, out in the Burbs. Mm -hmm. um, my upbringing, I thought, was normal, I guess, like every kid does. And that upbringing was uh, mum running around frantically after four kids, uh, mm -hmm. of which I'm, I'm the eldest, trying to trying to run the business uh, with, with dad also running the business alongside her. Uh, and dad would go out in the morning, fix things, and my job was to go to, go to school and not get in trouble. <laughs> um, so that business that they ran was uh, was a plumbing business essentially, mm -hmm. and since then, uh, since then, both of my brothers have gone into plumbing. Uh, I've got a cousin who's gone into plumbing. Uh, my best mate from um, from primary school days has gone into plumbing, mm -hmm. uh, and since Dad retiring from the plumbing business, he decided to go back to TAFE and teach plumbing. So, <laughs> uh, so why I'm not a plumber, I don't know. Uh, I I do know a bit about plumbing. I know all the all the key rules. Um, so the key rules, if I can remember them, are hots on the left. Uh, shit flows downhill, payday's Thursday and don't bite your fingernails. <laughs> so if we need to get further into plumbing, let me know. Um, but uh, how did I end up where, where I am? I think probably learning the importance of money was, was part of it for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember mum taking me to McDonald's after school and I thought, fantastic, how good's this? And she turned to me and said, go, get, go in there and get an application form. <laughs> uh, my attitude changed pretty quickly, but... <laughs> I started working there and I, I remember coming home after midnight, like 12.30 a.m. Mum would pick me up and I earned, I think, $4.84 an hour. Wow. Uh, so I'd come home, I'd have less than $20 pre-tax money from that and I would think, that was so hard to make that $20. There is no way I'm just going to spend this on something that, that I don't need. I think that got me into saving. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you have a little bit of su success with saving, it becomes exciting because you see the number getting bigger. And there was a point where I moved that money into an online savings account and they paid me a decent amount of interest. And I remember getting the bank putting $20 of interest in my account 
and thinking, I didn't have to do anything for that $20. It's free money. Yeah. I mean, how good's that? I've put nothing into this as opposed to the four hours at McDonald's. Uh, mm. This is fantastic. So I, I think that got me interested in getting my money to earn me money as opposed to me going out and doing it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, $20 a month is probably not enough to live on for most people, um, but it was exciting nonetheless. And so I think as I got later into high school uh, and then eventually university, I started reading books on property investing largely because I'd seen my parents buying the family home and making money that way, mm -hmm. uh, but I couldn't afford a property and that sort of led me to, to read books on um, stock marketing investing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I developed a little bit of uh, a little bit of an interest there, and in late high school, everyone's trying to work out what they want to do for a job, and I realise, uh, I guess I'm a little bit different for, from some people in my family in that I, I tend to be more of an observer, I spend a lot of time thinking, I'm a bit more analytical and, and logical. So uh, there's a very deliberate path in terms of me trying to work out what I could be good at. Uh, I also had an economics teacher who made economics really enjoyable in year 12. And we'd run through exercises where he'd split the class up into two halves and he'd say, right, you're one side of parliament, you're the other side of parliament. Here's a piece of legislation I want you to debate against the pros and cons in an economic context. Mm -hmm. And I just was fascinated by uh, how all the different concepts in economics are interlinked. And the more you learn, the more you understand about the world. And then over and above that, you, you can start to apply um, mathematical models to understand how countries interact and companies interact mm. uh, which became fascinating so I thought look this is this is clearly a direction I need to go in uh, went to uh, Macquarie University studying uh, studying an economics degree eventually worked out that uh, that owning companies was a really good way to make money as opposed to trying to work out if currency XYZ is going up and, and the other one's going Mm. Yeah, it's all it's all a bit difficult. I think um, investing from that macroeconomic perspective, uh, and university is really where I worked out that that um, being a stock picker and, and an investor that's the sexy part of the industry. That's the part mm. that that is just really mentally engaging, gets you out of bed in the morning because there's always something new happening, uh, really dynamic. Mm. So I had this idea in my head of of what I wanted to do, and I became very fixated on on that. There's nothing else that I could think of that I wanted to do um, but then I didn't really find it very easy to get into the industry it was the start of a very long journey once I decided I want to be an equities analyst it took me something like five years before I got there so it wasn't the traditional uh, go through a graduate program um, uh, type scenario that would have been a lot lot easier uh, and I remember working at Colonial First State who are a large fund manager obviously and I thought look, I've got this job at Colonial First State. I'm speaking to investors and advisors on the phone, but if I just do a really good job at, at this fund manager, they'll just make me a portfolio manager or an equities analyst one day. Uh, and it only took me a few months before the reality sunk in that there's 1,500 other smart people in that organisation that want to be an equities analyst. Um, so I guess uh, one of, the, one of the, the break that I got you know, I talk about being from that plumbing family. I didn't really know anyone in the industry. I didn't have anyone to call, anyone to talk to. I didn't know where to start learning about it, so I'd just take in whatever I could. Uh, and one day, came home from work. Uh, Dad, Dad realised that, um, you know, I wasn't particularly happy with what I was doing at the moment. I said, "Oh, look, anyone can do this job. I want to, I want to use my brain." And he said, "Oh, look, I've, I've organised a call for you with um, this guy I used to go to high school with." Uh, his name's Chris Parker. I haven't spoken to him um, for a while, but he used to work at Citibank. And I mm. thought, great, Citibank. How, like, Dad, I don't want to sell credit cards. Um, <laughs> I don't see how that helps. But you've said that I'll call him, so right, fine, I'll, I'll call him. I remember being in at Colonial First State really, really early one morning um, behind the computer, and I, I called this guy. No one else was in the office. Uh, and he said, okay, your dad tells me you work at Citibank. And I said, well, no, my dad's confused. He doesn't know where I work. <laughs> I work at Colonial. He said, okay, Colonial, all right, uh, look up this person in your little um, internal directory. So I, I typed that in uh, and he says, what does that guy do? And I said, well, he's the head of distribution for Asia Pack." And I thought, that sounds quite confusing, but it also sounds like a big deal. And he said, type in this name, uh, who, what's that guy do? And the second guy worked for the first guy. And he said, yeah, okay, well, I, I got them their jobs um, 
back, back in the day. So I did a little bit of Googling, who's this guy on the phone that I'm talking to, uh, and found out that he, uh, at one point, he was responsible for $100 billion of fixed income um, <laughs> portfolios uh, run out of UK for government organisations, um, or governments, I should say. Uh, and I thought, oh, this, this guy's not going to get me into selling credit cards. This guy knows something about something. <laughs> so he was very much a mentor to me. Um, he wasn't based in Sydney, so it was conversations that we'd have over the phone. I'd get into work early and he'd say, right, this is where you are. You want to get over here. Let's try and fill the dots in in the middle. Uh, and so I n- never really got handed a, a connection to get into the industry. But like I said, I was very clear about what I wanted to do mm-hmm. and he'd, he'd gone through that journey in the past. So he was always there on the other end of the phone to sort of coach me through um, yeah, how to, how to get there. So I don't know if you like I could talk talk through mm. what that process looked like. Yeah, because from your CV, so to speak, I could see that you've done the CFA program, so the Chartered Financial Analyst program. You've then gone and done more work on the data science side. You've taken extra courses, those types of things. And as you said, deliberate was like that. You knew where you wanted to be. There was point A to point B, and just it was just a way to get there. But there's so many people that listen to this show that were are in a similar situation to where you were perhaps so maybe you could flesh that out a little bit and kind of the steps you took yeah and i've had people approach me and and ask me this oh how do you how do you get the job Mm. and uh, i'm not really sure how to answer that in a concise way because for me it was a bit of a journey uh but you know if you set your mind to something you've just got to work out the steps in between and keep going at it until you get there so for me uh, obviously I had a bit of coaching over the phone as to the things that I needed to do uh, like I said I didn't know anyone so I thought what's going to get me closer the Chartered Financial Analyst Program uh, was was a big deal for me it's it's not easy mm. uh, I think the pass rate when I did it was somewhere between 35 and 40 percent um, for each of the three levels so it's not something easy to get through and it, it felt like a bit of a ticket So as I was moving through different jobs at Colonial First State, trying to get closer to the analyst role, uh, I also managed to catch a break with uh, Bell Potter, who are a stockbroker. Had a job going for, uh, I think it was for someone who was just collating research and sending out research. And I thought I would do, it doesn't sound like a great job, but I'd do that for free because I'm in there sitting next to the equity analysts. Mm. Uh, and they, they'd they seen that I'd been studying um, or moving through that Chartered Financial Analyst Program. Thankfully, or a bit lucky on my behalf, they had someone that worked there that had just uh, failed Level 1 and complained about how hard it was. <laughs> uh, so when I came in and said, yeah, I've done Level 1, I'm looking forward to Level 2, they thought, this guy's, this guy's got something. He, he obviously knows something about financial statements, you know, quantitative methods, um, portfolio management economics, at least at least a little bit given his degree and he's moving through this program. Um, so they ended up offering me an assistant quantitative analyst role uh, and that had analyst in the title and I thought, <laughs> how good's this? I've got, I'm halfway there, I just need to change the other word. Uh, so people ask me sometimes, oh, why did, you, why did you get into quant? For me, uh, to be brutally honest, it was a stepping stone towards what I, what I wanted to do. Uh, and... It was really good experience. I mean, so at, at Bell Potter, one of the key ele- or a couple of key elements in the role, one was working for um, for my boss, the head of quant, uh, so helping him with quantitative stock market research that would then be issued to clients, mm-hmm. um, building databases and data sets that would be sent through to clients in terms of uh, earnings and valuation data that clients would pick up uh, on a feed every morning. Uh, and then I also had a bit of a quality control role. So when analysts published their uh, their notes in the morning. The night previous, I'd go through their financial models and I'd make sure that the the profit and loss statement matched the balance sheet, matched the cash flow, or at least they'd reconcile. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was some level of logic to, to the forecasts. So that was really helpful in terms of getting some, some hands-on experience mm-hmm. there and then also understanding the differences in terms of how you'd model companies across different industries. Uh, and I think Bell Potter was a little bit of a segue into how I ended up moving to my next uh, firm, which was called Osbill Dexia at the time, and they had a junior quantitative analyst role going. And my boss at Bell Potter knew my my boss at uh, or future boss at at Osbill, so put in a good word. Uh, 
they, they obviously, for, for whatever reason, they saw something in me um, uh, and they brought me on board. And there were some similarities and differences in the role at, at Ausbuild. Um, I, mean, I looked after proprietary ranking models uh, for the company and was supportive of the, the broader analyst team. Uh, so I really enjoyed reporting season every year because I'd managed to automate a few things and build a bit of time into my daily schedule. <laughs> and analysts had no time whatsoever. So I'm talking about the, the large cap, mid cap pool of analysts and then there was also a small cap team at Ausbuild. They had, they had no time in, in August. So when they're running around like headless chooks saying, oh, I've got to get to this meeting, this meeting and this meeting, I'd stand there and go, oh, I'll, I'll take that one for you. <laughs> so I got the chance to go meet companies and come back with feedback and, oh, this is what I think, what, what do you think? Uh, so that was, that was extremely exciting. And then at some point, at some point um, management came to me and said, look, uh, we, think, we think you probably want to be an analyst. Uh, and I hadn't really made it that clear to them at the time because I was trying to do a good job in, in my current role, um, but I wasn't going to turn that down. And, and they said, large cap or small cap? And I thought, That's, that one's a no-brainer. <laughs> uh, there's so much more opportunities in the small, small mid-cap space uh, and QVG where, where I am now. We're small mid-cap specialists mm. and I think we've, we've proven that there's, there's alpha to be captured in that space. Um, so that was really the, the genesis of it. Uh, and then I'm also quite... Uh, quite fortunate in I mean I explained how I ended up at, at Ausbill. Uh it was because there was an opportunity there not not necessarily by design but luck would have it the two guys that ran the small cap strategy at, at Ausbill uh, were not only were they good blokes but they were incredibly incredibly good investors so that Ausbill micro cap fund uh, that eventually I became a, a part of uh, over the seven years that, that the team was there did 28% uh, Per annum, yeah, well. uh, so so I effectively did my apprenticeship uh, under some of the best guys in the market, uh, and I like to think that I was a sponge along the way as well. In that, uh, you know, I had all these economics from uh, sorry, not economics. I had all this education from my um, from my degree at university and from this chartered financial analyst designation, uh, but it was all theory. Mm. And to sit next to practitioners day in, day out and really get, roll your sleeves up, get on the tools uh, was just absolutely in, invaluable. So my philosophy has effectively um, been adopted to a large extent from, from those early days in the Ausbill micro cap team. Mm. You talk a lot about um, the quantitative approach that you took and I find that because you had the deliberate strategy, some people wait too long to recognise that they have to fill a spot in a team to become invaluable. And so it seems to me that, you know, I, I, I speak to a lot of fund managers, I've met with a lot of fund managers over the years, and there's almost always one person in the team who feel, fulfills that quant role, whether mm. or not that's their end goal. But it's such an invaluable part of investment process, I find, particularly when you get into these more established shops where there might be multiple funds and there's an overarching philosophy at the firm so it kind of distills the the universe down and now i'd like to jump into that process a bit more and maybe we can dig into the ranking that mm -hmm. you've overseen and, and and i guess refined over time so why don't you just just give us your elevator pitch i, I imagine you're, you're getting quite good at this now just from a, the portfolio construction what do you tell people that differentiates what you do from say everyone else in the market I think we're, there's actually quite a lot of things that differentiate us, um, but I also think about it in terms of importance because there's some big things and there's some small things. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the key edge that we have is that we're high conviction fundamental stock pickers. Uh, we don't get too caught up in macroeconomic gyrations. We're, we're out there wearing out shoe leather, speaking to companies, working out what they're worth uh, and trying to identify companies that are good businesses mm -hmm. and good businesses getting better uh, it, it's probably a bit of a simplistic way to talk about it but um, they're really key elements in terms of making money there's a lot of different ways to make money but um, there's some key elements in terms of why good businesses getting better uh, is a winning formula so we can talk about what what is a, a good business if you if you look at a company's financial statements 
uh, the key metric is going to be return on invested capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not the first one to, to work this out, uh, <laughs> but for some reason it's, it feels like not everyone has quite worked this out. It's how much money do I put in and how much money do I, do I get back out? So the cash flow statement, um, the balance sheet and the profit and loss are all, uh, are all at least as important as each other. So you need to take that holistic view. So, so returns on invested capital uh, are a key part of the, the process. And any, any sort of business that's got a sustainable competitive advantage is going to be able to earn higher returns on invested capital than, than its competitors or, mm-hmm. or other companies across different industries. And then the reason that that becomes so important uh, is over time your returns will start to look more and more like the returns on invested capital that that business is is earning. So you might sit there and say, "Well, hang on, what about what about what you pay for it? You can't you can't remove mm. price from um, from returns." And you know I can't argue with the maths of that because that's spot on. Uh, but the the price that you pay for a business over a long period of time starts to become less and less important relative to the capital that's washing through the balance sheet uh, and the cash flows of, of that business. So as they reinvest, are they reinvesting it in, in the business at high rates or, or low rates? Uh, and then what's coming back out of it in terms of dividends or, or share buybacks? Um, uh, and the weight of the capital that's flowing through those statements over time becomes very large relative to the purchase price that you've paid initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... So that's why it's important. Probably helps adding a little bit of context with an example. Uh, and I was thinking before about you know some of the things that we've done done wrong in the past. The, <laughs> the list is the list is varied. One of the popular sayings uh, at our uh, in our office is every decision's a mistake. If it goes up, you should have owned more of it. And if it goes down, you shouldn't have owned it in the first place. <laughs> Imagine running a long short fund. Now, now I've got four different ways to make mistakes. <laughs> but a mistake that I've made with a good business in the past uh, would be uh, would be Levisa, and that's an interesting one because I think their headquarters are just down the road. Mm. Um, they that was a, a good business. You go look at the returns on capital that, that they generate, and they're on an incremental store that they open. They're triple digit, so you're getting your your money back in in the first year for a lot of those stores. Uh, even moving into somewhere like the US where the returns aren't quite as good, they're spending maybe 350000 US for your fit out and your inventory uh, and then they should be earning, uh, I would have thought, upwards of 175000 US per store. Um, so you're still earning 50% returns for each incremental dollar of capital that's going into that business. Um, but coming back to a, a mistake that I'd made on that business in the past was uh, that that was a good business for the reasons that I described uh, and there was a point there where it was getting better, where they started talking about the UK and they'd say, look, the first rule of LaVisa Club is, is we don't <laughs> talk about pilots. Uh, but but it, was, it was clear that they were testing the UK and they wanted to roll out there. And the market was really uh, was rewarding them for that and the share price was moving up. And so at that point, I had a pretty fixed view in terms of what I wanted to pay for a retailer. And I was just so frustrated that I couldn't get that business at that price. Uh, I didn't want to overpay for it. Mm. In hindsight, I probably should have, you know, listened to myself when it comes to the returns on capital that come back out of that business and how they be, they they make your initial purchase price less significant, uh, because that that eventually got away. So we fixed that mistake uh, by owning owning a slice in that business. So we're now exposed to that reinvestment runway in something like a Lavisa, and, and so I think that's that's the good business part of it. Uh, at least to a large extent and and the getting better part if you can buy a business that's at an inflection point um, or even picking inflection points is is not easy but something positive is changing within the business you really supercharge your returns so using that LaVisa example uh, when they were rolling out in in the UK they had uh, they had multiple geographies that they were earning money in uh, and the UK was adding a leg of growth to the business, but it was also proving that, that the model works pretty broadly. Mm. And so what that does is it, is it shows you that there's actually quite a lot of white space on this planet. There's a lot of young girls out there that want to buy cheap jewellery for a Friday or a Saturday night. Uh, so so the, the quality of the business was, was going up and it was a matter of time before the market started recognising that. And I, I think... If you try and break down how you make returns out of a stock, you've got three different components. You've got 
uh, what happens with the valuation? So does your earnings multiple go up or down? Uh, what happens with your earnings? Do they, do they grow by 10%? Do they grow by more or less? Uh, and then the cash that, that's uh, coming back to you as a shareholder or, or being reinvested. There's a lot of things you can do with cash, whether that's uh, acquisitions, reinvesting it in the business, um, paying it out as a, a divvy or, uh, or as a share buyback. So LaVissa in that context, with regards to how we make money out of those three things, because it was getting better, the earnings growth was accelerating. So you used to get X amount of earnings growth, but now it's, you know, it's more than, more than X. So your returns there are getting better. The valuation is going up in that business because mm. people are saying, geez, I can't remember what they were at, maybe 200, 200 odd stores, I think, at that mm. point. Uh, imagine how many stores they can have on the entire planet. So the longevity of growth was there. So people were going to pay a high multiple for that business. And we talked about before, it just it spews cash. Um, the returns are, are phenomenal. Mm. So so that was you could really get the trifecta in that stock, which which supercharges those returns and, and brings them forward. So I'd love to sit here and tell you that we have forty Levisas in the portfolio. That there's not there's not enough of them out there, but that's the core of what we're trying to find, uh, and that's that's really the sweet spot for us. But- I feel like you just broke down that myth around what is return on invested capital and why is it so important. That that one example and the, the breaking it down to the store level, that granularity. For people sitting along at home, we've heard about return on invested capital, incremental returns on invested capital many times. Mm. That one example illustrates that point really well. But I feel like for just to round this out and to get through to that part of your process, my understanding is there's effectively five steps in your in your process to get to finding these types of companies. Um, there's traditional filter. It seems like you screen for liquidity, obviously because you need to get in and out of positions mm-hmm. and profitability. Is it a go anywhere approach with you or do you kind of stick on the industrial side of town that you don't go to resources and biotech and all those types of things? Uh, yeah, I guess there's a few things in there. Look, it is a go anywhere approach. But we end up with with really significant skews in the portfolio uh, with respect to to sectors. Mm-hmm. So, geez, I'm going to repeat myself a lot here with this return on invested capital <laughs> phrase. But you look at industries like mining services or, or mining in general. Uh, there's their businesses that that will typically hold a smaller weight in the portfolio, and we need a specific reason to to be there. Mm-hmm. Why is that? It's because the amount of cash that has to go back into those businesses to um, to yeah to to grow them or maintain your earnings. So when you think about that that equation of the three things that uh, the three ways to make money out of a stock, your valuation doesn't necessarily change too often with those businesses unless you're uh, unless you're going through an accelerating or a decelerating cycle, mm-hmm. I mean we're fundamental stock pickers, so so we're not necessarily the best at, at picking when when cycles occur. Um, so uh, yeah, so you not you won't necessarily get that valuation improvement. You're not often going to get the cash because the cash has just got to go back into the business to to maintain your earnings. Uh, and then if you get earnings growth, it's it's nice, but. At what cost do you get your earnings growth? Often the balance sheet will have to expand at the same rate as your earnings. So even though the absolute dollar number for earnings is higher, you've had to employ a lot more capital to, to do it. And that earnings growth is not necessarily accretive to your return. Mm. So the, the, the types of businesses that we find uh, more difficult and will need a specific reason, a, a change within the business um, to own them. So. Uh, Improving returns on capital coming from a low base is, is obvious is often a good way to make money, but uh, preferably we'll own things. I mentioned uh, Lavisa. When I think of that name, I just think cash. Hmm. Uh, think of a software business. Um, typically, we we have a high skew to uh, to industrials, as you mentioned. Uh, software businesses have been represented pretty heavily in the portfolio in the past. In in the past, they did trade at more reasonable hmm. valuations than they do now. But, but they would spew cash. So a business that, that will grow its uh, revenue by, by 10%, for example, think about the incremental costs that they've got to put in when they sell uh, you know, extra Microsoft 365 license or whatever it is. They don't actually need to put much cost back in there. So your earnings tend to grow faster than your revenues in those businesses. And then if you think about the reinvestment equation, what have you got? You've got 
you've got people. You need to keep your your software up to date, uh, obviously. But you don't go. And, you don't need to buy new trucks. You don't need to fit out a new office every few months. Uh, so so your earnings growth your earnings growth can be really quite powerful. But then you get it all back in in cash as well. Typically with those kind of businesses. Mm. So there's some SKUs in um, that often end up in the portfolio through time. I mean, we, we look across the whole market, uh, and this probably links back into the, the screening that you might have talked about or that you did talk about, where we look at the whole market and think, what is this thing? I, I, don't, I don't necessarily need to think about it as a retailer or a software business or a mining services business, or uh, I don't necessarily need to compare it directly to its peers. What if I just think about it as a cash box? How much money do I have to put in and versus how much money do I get back out? And this is what we do with our ranking model and uh, and screening is we have we have everything in there that, that we're willing to own or willing to consider. Mm-hmm. Uh, high quality, low quality, different types of business models. And we rank them on a few key metrics. And then we go and look at it and we say, how much do I have to pay for this? And then how much money is it going give, to give me back? So it's a really good way of, mm-hmm. of canvassing the entire market and understanding whether I should be paying... Uh, you know, more for this retailer or more for this software business, regardless of the, the industry that they're, they're um, operating in. Uh, so, yeah, so it essentially gives really good context. Mm. That's a really good, another really good analogy there with the, the money box or the cash box. One thing I think of when you were talking about, almost about leverage before, it's kind of the distinction between operating leverage versus financial leverage in a business. Mm. So knowing the businesses that can grow without shoveling money back into that cash box so to speak Uh, in an interview in the past i think it was mary manning brought this up and she was talking about you know risk is often on the balance sheet but potential is on the income statement or cash flow statement because you go long and short does that factor into the short book that i guess you you seek if you not necessarily that you might be seeking it out but if you are seeking out something too short would you be more focused on the balance sheet, say, over that kind of return on invested capital? Are you looking for like a, a certain combination? I'm trying to angle at, you know, how would you just how would that filtering process differ? Yeah, I I feel like this is almost a softball question, and you may have heard me speak in the past because uh, it really is a core of a core part of the way we think about shorting. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if that no, was by chance no, or no. by design, but uh, <laughs> but you hit the nail on the head. Maybe you should come work at QVG. <laughs> Uh, let us know if you're in the market but yeah shorting it it's really important Um, I mean one of the things in in the screening tool is we do screen for balance sheet strength because we want to know what optionality do management have to go and make an acquisition or reinvest in the in the business Uh, and conversely if you've got a weak balance sheet it really takes away optionality from uh, from management and then it's probably also symptomatic of some of the qualities around that business how do they how did that balance sheet get so stretched to, Mm. to begin with have they gone and had to go and pump a lot of capital into this business to try and keep earnings where they are? Um, uh, and then how that works for shorting, there's probably a couple of key elements there. But one is people say, people, so many people say shorting's hard and it, it is hard. But one of the key things that, that you can do to make it easier for yourself is identify a catalyst. And balance sheets are office, uh, often a really great catalyst for uh, for a stock to move back towards fair value in a scenario where uh, where fair value is is lower, mm-hmm. because the clock starts ticking. So if they if they can't generate cash out of their business, if it's something that has low returns on capital and a high reinvestment requirement, or maybe even there's some funnies in the accounting and, and real earnings are probably closer to what's on the cash flow statement than the P and L. That balance sheet doesn't get better, so so they've got to go out and uh, and raise capital at some point. And typically, the market will go and look at uh, look at that business and say, "Oh, geez, they need capital." So the share price will come down as people anticipate a capital raise, and then that business has got to come to market and raise at a discount so that it entices people to put money in. So you end up with this double discount scenario, uh, and and you don't have to sit there waiting. Uh, waiting to see what happens within the business because as I mentioned the, the clock's ticking mm. the the other part is um, financial leverage you talked about often you can get scenarios that are really skewed in terms of your risk return outcome 
So uh, as high conviction stock pickers, this is what we're looking for in day in, day out. If we can find a scenario where if things, if things get a little bit better, uh, the stock's probably priced fairly or if st- things don't change, the stock's probably priced fairly. But if something goes wrong, uh, and often we'll be looking for those signals in a business that, that could cause it to have earnings risk as well, uh, then the financial leverage of that means that, that your equity value can shrink very rapidly. Uh, again, it sounds a bit, um, a bit abstract without an example. So using something like, uh, something like a, a speed cast has been mm-hmm. a, a winner for us in the short book. Uh, I mean, we're no, we're no longer short and I can talk through that process. But it's a business that we've owned, uh, owned in the past, followed it since IPO, really got to understand how the business works, uh, listen to management in terms of their plans along the way and how they've executed to that strategy, find out what hasn't happened uh, and what might not have gone quite as well as they were expecting. Uh, there, there were some telltale signs as to why there was some earnings risk in that business, but they've been acquisitive along the way. Uh, so the balance sheet was really stretched uh, and then earnings looked like they were, they were at risk. So that's one where pretty poor returns on capital uh, and, and pretty average cash generation has been its history led us to initiate a short position. But in terms of the timing, we really ramped up the, uh, the weight. One, when, when we saw that, that earnings risk uh, and, and two, because of the, the balance sheet leverage. So in a stock like that, uh, trying to remember the prices, I think we would have been short around the three dollar twenty mark, and, and ultimately closed it out at, at eighty cents. You can see how much leverage there is in that equity when their balance sheet is is full of debt. It doesn't take much of an earnings miss mm. um, for that share price to move in a big way. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, you, know, you could use the example of home ownership and one one person having an LVR or loan to value ratio of ninety five percent versus seventy percent. There's yep. a, you can quickly crush whatever you have, and you can get negative equity if you if you have a lot of leverage in the bus- or in the house. In this example, yeah. So just to take your words out of your own mouth, if you've got a, a loan to value ratio of of eighty percent, so you've bought a million dollar house, you've put two hundred thousand dollars in equity, you've got eight hundred thousand of debt, and that million dollar house drops twenty percent. Doesn't happen very often in a falling interest rate environment like we've had, but a twenty percent move can lead to a hundred percent reduction of your equity. And that's, that's the same uh, with stocks. So instead of the asset value of the house, the words we use are the enterprise value of the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't really look at, at PE ratios very often because you're only really valuing the, the equity, uh, looking at the equity of the business and not taking into account the full value of the asset, which is the equity plus the debt. Mm-hmm. So if you add the equity and the debt, that's what we call an enterprise value, so the total value of the asset. And the same example uh, applies if you have a, an earnings miss which will cause uh, your earnings, well, the valuation is gonna be lower because you're applying your multiple to a lower uh, earnings number. Mm -hmm. You can potentially have some valuation compression when people, um, or a lowering of the earnings multiple, I should say, when people realize that there's a problem in the business. And then that leverage is really the icing on the cake uh, if you want a stock price to move in a big way. Mm. It seems like that's a really good segue into just a little quick question I've got here because in the absence of experience and years of experience some investors are often quick to jump at you know quick tricks that they can draw on to spot these types of opportunities in the wild if you like so for example um, one thing I've asked short sellers in the past is there any I guess problematic areas that you focus on when you're looking at these businesses from a short point of view, for example, you know, I'm talking about like cash conversion, revenue recognition. Are there any particular things over your time in the market that you've honed in on? You've said, okay, that's a typically that's where I find a lot of problems. Mm. I mean, it probably comes back to what we've been talking about with balance sheets and earnings risk. It's it's been a really lucrative area for us. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different signals that you can uh, that you can look for, and cash conversion is a real real big one although I think we've kind of talked about mm. that and how that impacts your your balance sheet uh, but often there's a lot of there's a lot of subtle signs going on as well and so we're not necessarily there thinking purely about the the maths like we 
we like to think of ourselves as, as pragmatic. We're not we're not zealots and just uh, and purely focused on on the numbers. We're practitioners, so we, we want to sort of understand what what the other guys thinking. So how management make money or what management are up to. So uh, mm. the specific transactions in the market where where a company might go out and make an acquisition, and you think, how does how does this make? That's a bit of a deviation from strategy. It doesn't really make sense to me. Mm. Why are they doing this? And there's quite a few examples in the market where the real answer is because you, your core business was stuffed, uh, and they thought we have a big earnings hole. Um, there's there's a bit of an issue with our existing asset or or whatever it is. We don't want to come out to the market and say earnings are going backwards. So instead, let's go buy some earnings. Uh, they'll put together a presentation, pitch it to investors, uh, say, hey, look look how much earnings accretion there is with this deal. People will get very excited. But what's actually happened is they've gone and expanded their, their balance sheet uh, to buy those, those incremental earnings. And if, if they're really good as a management team, they'll be able to sell the dream so that the multiple goes up and, and you don't get a derating in the share price. So we're often... Uh, we're often looking beyond what the numbers are telling us and looking towards what what subtle clues management are giving us with their behaviour as to what they're thinking and what they're telling us about their existing business. I mean, another just classic example would be when, when companies say, uh, when they start coming out and saying, just to let you know, most of our earnings are going to come in the second half this year. And then you've got to sit there and go, why? Okay, well, they've given me a bunch of reasons, but I, I, I really shouldn't be stopping at just those reasons. Uh, one thing we find in the market is is good news tends to, to be released quickly and slow news tends to be released quite... Uh, sorry, not slow news, but bad news tends to be released quite slowly. So people are naturally optimistic and they might say internally, look, we're running behind our, uh, our budget we don't think we're going to hit this earnings number for the half. But hey, if this goes right, if this goes right, if this goes right, we're still going to get there. It's just more of it's going to come in the second half. So you can see how that, that mm. works internally. And the last thing a management team wants to do is, is come out to the market and say, uh, look, we've downgraded our earnings for this half and then later find that they've done something well and, and have to upgrade later. So that that bad news tends to move, uh, move slowly. But... But what happens if things don't change? And typically, there's a bit of earnings momentum in businesses where, where whatever's going wrong at that point in time, it's it's pretty optimistic to think that that just turns turns on a dime. Generally, operating conditions take a bit of time to turn around. So, if anything, things will be flat to to worse in a scenario like that. Uh, and so, that's just another example of a of a clue to mm. look for to to find out what's happening internally. It seems to me a big part of that is understanding management. Obviously, incentives. You know, Charlie Munger always says, "Tell me where I'm going to die, and I won't go there." Yeah. And you know, I guess f- not everyone has exposure to management. Not many people pay as much attention to it as probably they should. Do you always get out and meet management? You go to the AGMs. You do all of that sort of stuff. Um, and if you do, I guess what are you looking for, in particular, in a manager and incentives? It's a very broad question, I know. Yeah. But it's kind of like just any kind of wisdom that you've broken down or distilled over the, the, the time that you've been yeah. managing money. You, you might have heard some of these answers uh, in the past, but obviously alignment is critical. The problem with the problem with being on a board and trying to incentivize management of a business is, is how do you do it? There's so many different mechanisms, but they all encourage different types of behavior. Uh, some of that behaviour might be good, some of it might not be so good for mm. shareholders, but it really pays to go through the annual reports and, and work out, uh, is this company incentivised on uh, earnings per share growth? I mean, as an investor, earnings per share growth sounds pretty good, but as a manager, if I, if I say, if I hit my hurdle this year, look how much I get paid, and I can get a lot of earnings per share growth by leveraging up the business, going to the Commonwealth Bank saying, can I have some debt, please? Uh, going and buy something that doesn't necessarily make sense, doesn't necessarily integrate well with the business, but you've got your earnings up uh, and you haven't had to issue more shares as a result, but you've hit your earnings per share hurdle. Uh, so it's not real value creation I- in that example. Uh, we like to see management that have got a lot of skin in the game. I'm not the first person to use the phrase skin in the game, but if, if they hurt, uh, sorry, if, if we hurt as investors, we want them to hurt as well. Mm. Uh, 
that's I mean that's as a bit of a side note that's kind of how we think about QVG so I've got all of my money invested in the fund I like to think that that's a bit of a, mm. a signal uh, in the same way that a manager having a lot of stock in their business is a bit of a signal as to how they're going to run it with respect to, to risk um, yeah so it really pays uh, just another recent example Latitude Financial I, I can mm. probably afford to talk about because it, it didn't get away uh, they tried to list it recently but Ahmed uh, Ahmed for who and CEO of that business was was going to get paid twenty two million dollars for getting it listed. Hmm. So all he needed to do was get the thing away, uh, and there was a huge pay packet for him there. And I think, without casting judgment, how can we believe anything that management are saying? Because there's just this huge incentive for hmm. for them to tell us what we need to hear. So that, I mean, that's a bit of a red flag. It also shows you how desperate the sellers are uh, to to get it away. They're like. Armoured, whatever it takes, just just sell this thing. It will, mm. We'll pay you what it takes. Um, yeah, so so signals like that are, are usually red flags for us. Mm. That's a good that's a good approach. Um, one thing that most I would say DIY investors or those that are learning uh, think about is that you know stock selection is obviously very important, and it is. You know, you do your research, but it's also a very intuitive process. So, it's, you know, understand the business, understand the risk, competition, etc. You know, it, it kind of makes sense, right? We just go and do that. But one point I find where most people get stuck is around the concept of portfolio construction and, and what's right. Mm. You've got an extra tool, kit, uh, tool in your kit because you can go short as well as long, whereas I'd say most, the majority of listeners probably don't go short. Mm. How do you think about portfolio construction for the fund? And even, I guess it's, your, 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 like you said, your personal wealth tied to it as well. Mm. Yeah, so that's a really good incentive to not stuff it up. <laughs> uh, so I guess that probably speaks a little bit to the way we think about risk management as well. So if the returns in the fund are bad, then that, that damages the net worth of myself and then also Tony Waters and Chris Prunty who work at the firm. Mm. Uh, they're the largest investors in, in the fund. So so the points or the question that you ask is, is an important one. Uh, the real, the real answer with respect to portfolio construction is you think about what we're good at. We've got a high performance culture at QVG and we're bottom up fundamental stock pickers. We're out there running around trying to find good businesses and, and that's really our edge. Mm. So when we think about uh, constructing the portfolio, uh, I've probably said this before, but we're not going to come in in the morning and say, what are interest rates doing? How many interest rate sensitive businesses do we have in the portfolio? Do we think the market's going up next week? Should we get more along the market? Do we, they're, they're not the kind of conversations that we have. We mm. have a macroeconomic view uh, and we incorporate it in so far as it impacts the, uh, the valuation or the earnings of our businesses. Mm -hmm. But if that's where our, our, our edge lies effectively in picking stocks, that should also be incorporated into the portfolio management process. So in the long short fund that I run, for example, typically we're going to be something like 200% 200 uh, 200% gross. So gross being if I if I add up the all of my long positions, so the stocks that I hold, uh, and add up all of the short positions, the stocks that I've borrowed and, and sold short, uh, add those two numbers together, that typically equates to something like uh, 200% or you know, maybe around the, the 190 mark. Mm -hmm. And then that's that's often going to be made up of, say, 120% long, and we can get the leverage because of the cash we get out of the shorts, and 70% short, which would get us to 190% gross exposure. So in that sense, we're doubling down on our stock picking ability. We're saying we think we can get this right, mm -hmm. and if we do get it right, we're going to be very right. If we get it wrong, we're going to be very wrong as well. So it, it can be uh, more of a speedboat than, than a ferry, meaning there's a few bumps in the road. But then how does... Uh, actually, the other point to make is probably what our net exposure yeah, looks like. Point. Yeah, so uh, so gross would be if you add up your longs and your shorts. Net would be if you take your longs and then you subtract your shorts from that. So in that example of 120% long, if we take away 70% short, we're left with 50% net long. So in dollar terms, there's going to be some level of correlation uh, when the market moves up 
we're likely to benefit somewhat from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the market moves down, there'll be some element of, um, of detraction from performance. But if we go back through what we've done at Ausbill or you look at the other fund at QVG, we've been so very different from the benchmark that most of our returns, most of our absolute returns have come from stock picking as opposed to picking market direction. So bringing it back to portfolio construction in the long short fund, uh, if we can if we can get out there and find a really high conviction short, that's going to go into the portfolio, and it's going to move the uh, the percentage that we have short up, and it's going to bring the market exposure down. Uh, or if we can find a lot of shorts, even if they're lower conviction, that's going to bring the uh, the value of the short book up and the market exposure down. And conversely, on the long side. So what we're really doing is we're not really paying too much in terms of uh, too, too much attention in terms of where the market's going to go. It's where do we find our best mm-hmm. opportunities, and that that historically has been in the small mid cap space, uh, and continues to be the case. Um, and then I think portfolio weights are, are really important. So there's a few angles there. Well, two two real angles: risk and return. So thinking about it on the on the short side, uh, if we start to see all of the things that we want to see in a short, like a really simple checklist just for example would be, does it have earnings risk? Tick, okay, it probably needs to be there in there at a 1% weight. Uh, does it have a leverage balance sheet? If there's a tick there, okay, well, um, you know, probably needs to be a higher weight than that, maybe a 2%. And, and uh, do we have a catalyst for it? Do we think that's coming soon? Uh, then maybe that becomes a three percent weight. So the weights will move in line with conviction. Uh, conversely, there's a risk management exercise that needs to happen. So shorts, you can lose a lot of money if, if mm. the stocks go up, and there's certain buckets in shorting uh, buckets of stocks that I would describe as um, detached from fundamentals, uh, and you can get very promotional management teams and very uninformed share registers that let these things go to silly valuations. So if you're trying to short a business like that, it it sounds fantastic in theory because it's overvalued and it should go down. But uh, like I said, we're not, we're not theorists. We're, we're, uh, we're practitioners. So that's something where if we're going to have a weight at all, we probably need a catalyst and it's probably going to have to be a small weight because the risk is, uh, the risk is that it moves even further away from fundamentals. Mm. So that's kind of how we think about uh, weights in the portfolio, both from a return and a risk perspective. Uh, and then talking about uh, why QVG is a little bit different to where we were at Ausbill is, is somewhat important, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, f- there's a few reasons, but the key one that I want to mention is that we're, we're unconstrained relative to what we've done in the past. So I mentioned we ran the Ausbill microcap fund uh, and I think the return series generated there, we were, we were really happy with. But working in a small team of three people, we, we don't have to write reports or mm. attend monthly meetings or daily meetings or make decision via committee at, at some of the things that I imagine happen in some of these larger shops. We've got a lot of flexibility and so when we moved across uh, we designed that flexibility into the portfolio as well and so with the long short fund we've basically said let's move the portfolio to where we're finding the best the best ideas so if the best ideas are concentrated within a particular sector uh, or a particular market cap band where we're going to take on some level of concentration risk by moving the portfolio to those best ideas because historically um, through time that's how we've generated our returns. Hmm. Okay. One thing you've said, or I, I read in the slide deck, was that valuations in the portfolio are monitored in real time. Mm. Um, f- for me, you know, I, I'd expect most PMs do that to an extent, but it's probably not monitored in real time. I'm keen to understand, and I, I imagine the audience is too, both how you do that, first of all, but... Um, why you do it and, and why you focus on value and not price as a signal? Yeah, uh, I mean, to some extent, I would have thought that, that the answer is obvious. Uh, price is what you pay, value is what you get. So, uh, you know, I'll pay a higher share price for a business that's growing faster or, or makes more money, quite obviously. So how, how the, um, the 
valuation in real time works is my quantitative background has given me a little bit of a toolkit. So uh, I think it just makes us a little bit faster and more efficient at what we do, which mm. saves us some time. Uh, and part of that is being able to build valuation into uh, into our screening tool. So price will feed in um, to our, our screening and ranking tool. Uh, and then price just price is just multiplied by the amount of shares on issue that, that we have in there to get the market cap. We add the debt to understand what the enterprise value is. And then we've, we've got a view uh, in terms of what pre-tax earnings are for these businesses, and we have that in the model. So price is just a live feed. Uh, that's, that's pretty easy to get your hands on. Uh, the real trick is, is um, one, what kind of an earnings number you're coming up with, mm. uh, because that's what, what, your val- sorry, what your valuation is based off. Uh, and then also how the market's going to trade that stock relative to, to that earnings number I talked about before accelerating growth can often lead to an accelerating or an expanding multiple I should say mm. so I think valuing uh, sorry monitoring those valuations in real time and we'll we'll print that out and look at it every single day that's something that we've been doing for oh, probably eight, eight years or so now uh, just gives you a real feel for what's working in mm-hmm. the market uh, what what mr. market is saying in terms of what values he's applying to different areas or sectors uh, it also gives you a, a good feel for what's uh, what's moving up through the rankings. So, like I said, we're earlier we're we're not only interested in in good businesses businesses, but we're interested in businesses that are getting better. So, so that valuation metric um, being live is balanced across uh, a series of other metrics, and we can go and see if a business still trades at a reasonable valuation despite the fact that it. Um, that there might be a change in its earnings, it might still have a strong balance sheet, and it might look really attractive to some other businesses with similar growth and valuation uh, characteristics. Mm. It just, for me, um, having, I guess, some type of valuation mindset, I just feel like it would be a very nice thing if, uh, if we all just thought in value per share. For example, we talk about price performance, and obviously that, you know, whether it be a lagging indicator, let's say, over time, or a leading indicator in some instances, but we had I had Carlos Gill come on the show recently, mm. and he talked about in one of his updates he talked about, and it was around reporting season how um, the earnings per share of each of the businesses as a, as a proxy for value, I guess, or um, value creation within those businesses, and I just think that's a novel way, and it's maybe perhaps not a novel way, but just a unique way approach to deliver a message to your clients to say, you know, price may have done this. But what you really need to focus on is the value per share. And I think in a way you're doing that too. That's your focus, right? Value, not necessarily price. You, yeah. That's where you're taking your cues. Yeah. And I think uh, value creation as well. It sounds like it might be a subtle difference, just sticking another word onto the end of it. But but uh, to use an easy one, that, that Le, Le Visa example before, it, it's an example of a business that's creating a lot of value. And mm. what you're... What you're paying is what could look like a fair price at, at that point in time but the market tends not to recognize uh, all of the subtle things that that you can't price in so uh, what what price do you put on a, a good management team what price do you put on understanding that the the real guy driving this behind the scenes is extremely ambitious and uh, he's he's not sitting on his laurels he's driving it really hard mm. um, delving into that example a bit more just uh, the culture within the business so Walking around their headquarters and, and seeing how um, how highly motivated um, all of the different teams are within that business, that's a pretty – it's intangible and it's very difficult to price. In fact, you're not going to price it, but you should be paying for it because over time they're going to surprise you positively. Uh, another example with that business, I remember doing some some floor walks and talking to the the person who, um, who was behind the desk selling the product and – she was so enthusiastic and so excited, and she was saying, "Yeah, and I've got to hit my I've got to hit my add-on target um, for the week." So, what the, the great way to, to uh, hit the add-on target is you sell a piece of silver because you say, "Oh, this goes with everything." And then the other great thing about silver <laughs> is that one's that one's slightly that's a higher price point. You can pay up to fifteen twenty dollars for one of these silver things, so that really gets your average selling price up. Uh, and then and then we have uh, th- this afternoon. The focus will be add-ons, so we'll sell them the piece of silver, and then when they come to the front desk, we'll just try and sell them a, sm- a small. I can't even remember what type of earrings they had at, at the front desk, 
uh, and she would say, yeah, I really need to hit my, my budget for the next few hours because then Natalie is coming on after that and I don't want to make it difficult for Natalie to, to get the, uh, the store budget for the end of the, the day. She wants to be a team player. And I thought, this girl's in her teens and hmm. uh, she's, she's running this store effectively like a, a business owner because it's hard to put your finger on, but that culture has filtered from the top down. Those systems and processes that they've implemented mean that there's going to be positive um, positive things that management do that you can't quite see and you can't quite price, but but at some point they they will happen. Mm. So uh, so we're happy to pay for future value creation in a lot of these businesses as well. Mm. well uh, I know we've moved on a bit, but one thought that came to mind with um, that live valuation comment that that you made, I remember a little while ago uh, just looking at Speedcast as a, as an example. Having, having an earnings model uh, when you and a, a strong view on valuation uh, and all the other things that go into that meetings with management, competitors, suppliers, etc., means that when new news comes out, uh, and especially being in such a small, nimble firm like QVG, we can, uh, we can decipher that and incorporate it into the share price immediately. So that's a scenario where the, the news will come out and I'll sit there and I'll... I'll I'm quite honest, honest with myself. I don't know if I'm a buyer or a seller until uh, until the stock opens. I have a firm view in terms of what the market should pay for this given given right. the news. I just don't know what price the market's gonna, uh, going to open at. So if it's a big enough uh, premium or discount to the price that I've got on the morning, we'll be in there as soon as the market's open um, adjusting that position. So you can see that live valuation. Uh, and I remember that, that stock got to the point where it was probably probably stretched. It got down to eight times um, EBIT or earnings before interest and in tax, uh, which which is just looking extremely cheap for a business like that. Um, but you also want to add a little bit of a practical element and you could see how aggressive the selling was in the market, that it was going lower. So it was trading below what I thought to be fair value. So I'm sitting there waiting, waiting to buy it back. Uh, and sure enough, that selling wasn't finished uh, and the market went to town on it day day two. In the meantime, I'd gotten and caught up with management, got an understanding of cash flows that were going to come back into the business. Realised that the balance sheet probably wasn't. I mean, it looked it looked pretty bad, but uh, it looked like they were going to be able to um, get through their their covenant period. The banks weren't going to come in and, and close the business up, but it was starting to be priced like that. So when I'm sitting there and you're getting extreme price action, two days of um, from memory, I think it was thirty percent down uh, eight, each day and saying seven and a half times EBIT, seven times EBIT. It's, it's just getting too cheap for a business that wasn't getting uh, going to go broke. So even though they hadn't necessarily fixed the balance sheet, the earnings risk wasn't taken off, off the table. That's an example of having a live valuation and just going, the rubber band is too stretched here. It's too far away from fair value. We need to, we need to start buying this business back. Mm. One area which I wanted to talk to you about, and is this is leading into it, is this idea of using a quant approach to markets and kind of bigger picture stuff. But people sitting at home probably can't, don't have that level of sophistication. I know I don't, for example, in, in, what, I, in what I do day to day. So how, how do you think, just I guess as a broad stroke, how do you think about quant and its role in the market? Do you think it's, you know, it's it, much like short selling, it's, it's probably a topical thing. Um, there's extremes, and do you think do you think you'd make the same amount of money without that approach? No, is the answer. Mm. Uh, no, we wouldn't. So, I like talking about this concept of uh, of being fundamental stock pickers, but um, but also being practical. Mm -hmm. And I think the practical element is becoming more and more important. And there's a real change in constituency in terms of participants in, in the ASX. I mean, globally, yes, but we operate within the ASX. So looking at, at our domestic market specifically, uh, there's just, I guess, the, the three main um, changes in terms of the constituency, or maybe there's four actually. You've got industry super funds winning a lot of money. They mm -hmm. have a very strong marketing pitch. We'll charge you less <laughs> is the marketing pitch. And hey, it's, it's, it's pretty strong. I mean, I don't like paying fees. Uh, or passive money 
the, <laughs> their pitch is, is effectively the same. We're not going to... You'll get a bit of everything. You'll get the bad stuff. You'll get the good stuff. But, hey, we're not going to charge you much. Um, and then quantitative is winning, winning flows in a big way as well. So there's some really large quant funds. You know, I can think of one that's at circa $30 billion under management now, and, and they must own something like... Two or three percent of the small odds, as an example. So they're pl- they're participating wow. in almost every stock, uh, and what's happening is is industry funds are winning flows, passives winning flows, quants winning flows, and the weight of money and also the where the money is going to is going to guys that aren't running around the streets, speaking to businesses, working out what's uh, what the outlook looks like, what are the key things to think about within that. That business so there's a bit of a tendency for valuations to maybe move a bit further from fair value than they have in the past but they there's a lot of momentum in stocks at the moment that's coming from uh, from those constituents so if I'm a passive fund anything that um, that's getting bigger within in the, in the index I obviously have to own more of uh, probably quant would be a large contributor to this so if a stock price is is going up uh, Maybe a good example to use would be Jumbo Interactive. So that, that's been a phenomenal story. That's gone from something like four dollars to twenty four dollars in in the last uh, in roughly the last twelve months. There's a good fundamental story there. Uh, it, it was a good well, sorry, it is a good business getting better. Uh, so that that Jumbo Interactive, you could see why other fundamental fund managers were going to come in and, and buy that story for the accelerating earnings growth. Uh, but then over and above that, it had this beautiful, um, beautiful line that just sort of seemed to steadily drift upwards for a while there. So it's got good price momentum, which is often a signal picked up by the quants. Mm. Uh, it had good earnings momentum, which is a signal picked up by the quants. It was upgrading, so positive earnings surprise. I mean, it's just uh, this is the perfect stock for a quantitative manager. So they would have been in there buying it after the fundamental guys. Um, pushing it higher beyond fair value, and then uh, and then also you have uh, index funds that were going to come in uh, and buy it as it as it went into the the top two hundred index, which is a, a widely followed index. So you had all of these factors uh, feeding on on each other, and we're sitting there going, "Look, we really like Jumbo. We really like the management. It's a great story. Would we pay this price today?" Probably not. It's actually getting quite expensive, uh, but but we're we're going to be really slow to reduce the weight uh, at that point in in that stock's life cycle, because, like I said, we don't want to be um, just wedded to our impro- approach and say this thing's worth ten times. We're going to sell it when it gets to ten times. We we want to say maybe it's worth ten times or twelve times or whatever whatever the number is. Uh, I mean, in fact, that's probably those numbers are probably a bit harsh. It's worth more than that, mm. but um, but we're going to say, look, we're quite happy to let this thing run beyond fair value and be. Let's just be realistic about this because we can see all the other buying that's that's going to come into the stock, uh, and and once that index buying has come out of it, uh, that's probably any a point at which we could reduce our risk in it. Mm. And it seems to me like what you said there is something that I give a lot of thought to. You know, we talk about it's pretty hard to argue with a passive approach to market and the track record that it's had over mm. the past 30 years, in, not just in Australia, but globally. But then further down the market cap spectrum, uh, maybe there are more opportunities from this type of, not necessarily price agnostic behaviour, but perhaps from strategies that rely on everything that can be automated, will be automated. Perhaps there's a an opportunity there for investors who do the boots on the ground research to f- who focus to your point earlier on culture and things that don't appear in financial statements mm. straight away and I, 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 just, I just think it, it was interesting to hear you talk through that because that is something that I think most people miss and most people assume that passive is taking everything therefore you should get on board with that but actually it could be quite the contrary yeah um, one one more thing I want to pick your brain on and it's quite a topical one is the the flack, if you like, that short sellers are copying. Mm-hmm. And my personal opinion is that it it aids in market it price discovery. Um, yes, there are self-interest on both sides of the camp, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts on that. And 
I guess, is it is it fair and reasonable? Is there something we can do better? Is there something the regulator can do better to, I guess, enable the market to be more efficient? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think taking short selling out of the market is is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Although, you know, potentially that I don't necessarily think that's been suggested. We we wouldn't consider ourselves activist or necessarily out there in the press. I mean, I, to be honest, I even feel a little bit uncomfortable saying, "Oh, we've been short speedcast." Uh, mm. Uh, I use it more for illustrative um, purposes because we, we don't want some of these businesses that we're making money from, all we're trying to do is get on board when it's going back to going back to fair value, whether that's a stock price going up or a stock price going down. And if you think about how much money we, we manage, we're not actually the marginal um, price setter we're, and we're not pushing these, these stocks to get in and out. We can be quite nimble. Uh, so we don't want to have a, detri- a de- detrimental effect on the share price. Uh, we've got no interest in um, getting, you know, going after management or, or saying negative negative things because there's not much in it for us. There's not much in it for for management either. Uh, I think one of the one of the things that you're alluding to is there's been a lot of short reports um, that have been hitting the market and mm. all from offshore. I think. Uh, you might have to help me here, but we've had Wise Tech, we've had Rural Funds. Uh, there's, there's been a, a list of these Blue things. Blue Sky. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Blue Sky, uh, Quintus. Cor- corporate was, Travel. Yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, we've got to think about the return on time invested equation here. What are, what are we gain for it? I mean, if we're going to sit there and uh, and put all of this all of this time in trying to convince the market of our view and push a stock to a certain price it's one there's a lot of time that goes into that uh two who knows we may be wrong i mean every everyone everyone makes mistakes uh consistently i think a lot of these short sellers haven't necessarily gotten it gotten it right uh and then you just end up in a battle that that doesn't really add any value Mm. so we're not uh in terms of what the market should do about these short reports, I mean, in my view, they're just opinions that, that come out. Some of them are informed, some of them are misinformed. Uh, look, my personal view is, is I'm okay with it, although I've got no interest in, in participating in it. Uh, you see it happen all the time in the US, everyone's got an opinion. And what it's doing is it's creating, uh, it's creating a bit of a conversation. And yes, it does move prices, but I mean, in my own selfish um, self-interest, I think that's great. If someone comes out with a short report that's not not particularly good and it pushes um, something like a corporate travel down to the cheapest multiple it's been in a long time, you've got to sit there and think, this could be a good buying opportunity. Mm. Uh, and so it, 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 in some ways, those short reports are creating more efficiency in the market, but there's also instances where they're creating inefficiency uh, uh, Credit Corp was another good example that mm. I forgot earlier. Uh, that short report was not not the best one I've seen out there, uh, and the market turned around and and bought that stock straight back up to where it was. Uh, and anyone who's gotten short has worn a lot of pain. So, yeah, I mean we're we're just a humble market participant, if if you will. Um, but I'm okay with it. They're just opinions. Mm. I think that's the thing, right? If you're informed, you don't tend to read too much into it. it it tends to be when you're you're not informed and all you hear is opinion and there's obviously a lot of inflammatory language and claims and things that i guess the a, a retail investor cannot prove because they mm. don't have access to management they don't do the walk arounds of the factory or whatever so that's kind of where i guess a lot of the frustration comes from is that yeah. lack of knowing and the, I guess the lack of experience with it. But yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And uh, I, I'd just add that uh, obviously misinformation and intentionally moving prices is, uh, I mean, clearly there's some question marks around the ethics there, but I think the important part is that the company is able to come out and say, uh, we have nothing to hide. This is how our business works. I can see that they've done a, a lot of work. You know, c- congratulations on doing your research. Um, but but he, here's the truth behind it. And then people can make up their own minds. Mm, for sure. Okay. Um, just as we come to the end, how can people find out more about you and QVG? You're on LinkedIn. You've got the, the website. Anywhere else? 
Yeah, uh, I'm pretty awful with social media. Uh, <laughs> I have a Facebook account that I used maybe a couple of decades ago, but uh, I am on LinkedIn. I, I'm not great at checking that either. So the real answer would be qvgcapital.com.au. Uh, if you want to see our ugly mugs, there's a page about you know who we are and what we do. Uh, it's got our performance up there uh, and it'll explain a little bit more about the couple of funds uh, that we've got. And I think there's uh, email addresses on there. So that's probably the key way to, to get in touch. Fantastic. Mm. All right, last question. Probably my favourite. If you go back in time and tell a younger you something about, why don't we just keep it to investing, what would it be? Mm. I think people spend so much time trying to find good stock ideas, uh, which you can't blame them for because we spend all this time thinking, I just need to find a good investment. I need to find something that's going to make me money. And when I find it, I'll buy it and it'll go up and I'm going to do well. Uh, but there's not there's not really enough of a conversation around portfolio management, I think. Uh, so that's probably something that I'd go back and tell a, a younger me that, that portfolio management is at least half the equation. So it, it's fine to say, um, it's fine to say yeah, I bought some of this business, um, I bought 2% or 3% of it and it did really well and, and sit here and pat myself on the back and well done, Josh, you, you own that. Uh, where you can add a real amount of value and, and really supercharge your returns using something like a Jumbo Interactive or uh, that I mentioned before, or another business called Service Stream went through a similar journey where you could see why it was going through a re-rating in the market, why the fundamental guys were going to buy it, why the quant guys were going to buy it, why the index guys were going to buy it. And if something's working, you've just got to strap it on. I mean, you need, you need to be risk aware but owning two or three percent in a in a business like that is nice. But if you can, and this is something that that we've done in the the long short fund, if you can move those things up to a seven eight percent weight, I think even Jumbo we got up to a ten percent weight at some point when they're going through these uh, these re rates, then you can make twice the amount of money uh, out of them than you otherwise would. You already have the idea. You already understand why it's working and uh, why others are going to buy it. Uh, and like I said, Jumbo's gone through through that re-rate, so we can now take it back down to a much, much smaller smaller weight. Uh, and I, yeah, I just think there's real value to be added through through getting things right with regards to portfolio management and stock picking is only half the equation. It's a great focus mm. area to finish, on. I think you're the only one that's talked about uh, portfolio management, but Josh, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Owen. That was good. Thanks for tuning into the RAS Network. To learn more about us, Head to the RAS Finance or RAS Media websites today.